on the robot. I think that was the most exciting. That is more exciting. Okay, thanks for your patience. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm all excited about being back in person and getting to use robots and things like that, but uh, we'll get the kinks out. So just to, um, some of you saw the piazza before you got here, so they're having trouble finding us a room. You know, I think that uh, my optimism has is, is dwindled a little bit. Um, I think we are, um, you know, our current thinking is we're not gonna uh, limit enrollment, but we're gonna do our best with what we can in terms of, uh, you know, having as many seats as are available as possible and, and getting through it and being as creative as we can to get through that. So uh, I don't have all the answers, but I'll answer any questions I can answer and we're gonna keep asking and asking and asking. There were some alternatives like, you know, teach the class on Saturday mornings at 8.30 a.m. and stuff like that. I, I didn't think that seemed like as good of an idea. Um, <laughs> so I think, th I think this is what we've got so, so far. Uh, if you have concerns or questions, let me know. If it doesn't make the classes appealing, I totally understand. So, um, okay, good. Uh, today we're gonna talk, so most of the class actually, we're gonna talk about software in some, you know, the, the sort of the AI behind robotics uh, and manipulation. But today, to get in uh, into it, I wanted to talk a little bit about hardware and uh, you know give you a sense for the hardware we're going to be thinking about in in the class a lot. Uh, this is the KUKA Iwa robot uh, in in the flesh, if you will, and uh, it's maybe bigger and more real than, than it looks on the cartoons. Uh, I brought a few hands. Uh, Danny's got some cool hands in the overflow room too, um, so you guys will be able to sort of poke around with that at the end uh, if you like. So um, let's, let's dig in. So first of all, I do want to just remind you that if you do uh, find the notes you know, useful, but all of these, somehow my click here isn't pointing to this anymore, but uh, don't click there, click there. And uh, in fact, I could even click there right now. Uh, and anybody can on the textbook, right? And it opens up the deep note, which you've started using for your P sets. Um, I think, yeah. Some of you realized that uh, when you duplicate, apparently it doesn't show this by default. So you have to sort of like, if you want to get to the exercise, you got to do that. Anyways, um, the chapter two notebook has some cool things, I think. It has uh, the ability to just drop in any robot. For, well, I, I listed four, but you could easily add a few more files um, and just let you move them around, get a sense for what they're like. Um, and it steps you through a bit of what it takes to simulate and some of the more you know, subtle aspects of simulation, which we'll talk through on the board a little bit, but I think playing with the code it will hopefully be pretty uh, informative. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, you know, there's a lot of hardware out there. Uh, we talked about the, the signals and systems, the dynamical systems abstraction last time. And I want to dig in a little bit more with that this time. So there's this view of, um, this sort of pure view of control, or even um, in reinforcement learning these days, you'll see a, a lot of people that you know, draw that simple version of the picture where I just have my robot, which has some sensors coming out. Actuators coming in, motors, actuators. Actuators is just a slightly more general term than motors. Motors I think of as being electric motors. Actuators could be hydraulic or anything. Motors are one type of actuator. Um, and then my control here. And really your control should take your sensors in and put out the actuators. <coughs> and you'll see um, the sort of ideal version of this or the stylized version of this in RL maybe they'll just say we're just going to go from pixel to torx. I actually like that as a um, as a charter uh, to, to try to think how do you go all the way from if your sensor is a camera and ultimately the thing you send to your robot is a torque then how do you how do you close that whole loop and what has to happen to make that happen. 
But if you look down at the details, and it's not just an implementation detail, I think it's fundamental and it's worth talking about in lecture here. Um, you know, you have some control box that you're allowed to access you know, through your drivers to the robot. Your robot, the EWA actually um, has an input that looks like torque. We'll talk about exactly what, that, what it is. Uh, but really, most of the robots out there don't actually let you send torques into the actuators. That's an idealized view of the world, and it's actually not what's happening on most of our robots, and there's you know, reasons why. You don't want to probably send raw torques directly to your robot. So even if, uh, you know, ironically, simulation, often you think about it as just a torque source, but, um, but actually there's a lot more going on. And that can dramatically impact your success or failure with, with control strategies. So we'll dig in a little under the covers um, there today. And it, the, the, what you find under the covers will depend on which arm you've taken. So my goal today is to talk a little bit about some of the robot arms out there. Um, the, the hardware choices you make matter. Uh, we picked the EWA as the one to think about mostly in the class. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you some of the things that's good about it. Um, <clears throat> I want to really emphasize this point that, that, there are, that physics, the physics engine, is a big part of what you need to do the simulation, but actually simulating that control box and all the other stuff is a big part of simulation too. So simulation is actually bigger than just physics. And, um, and even though we're going to abstract a lot of that away with the signals and systems abstraction, it pays to at least have an awareness of what's happening underneath there. Uh, and then I've got a bunch of robot hands too. Uh, we'll talk about some of the cool robot hands out there, some of the different approaches people have taken to building robot hands. And uh, we picked a simple gripper for class uh, uh, for this WSG, and I'll we'll tell you more about it and why. Okay, so um, the mandatory intro robot slide here is that you know robots are normally behind a fence. Right? This is actually where robots have seen most of their success. And even in newer fulfillment center kind of uh, workflows, a lot of times robots are behind a fence. Right? And um, this is a type of robot that's been incredibly successful in industry. Sometimes it's very powerful. Uh, it tends to be very rigid. Uh, it can move very quickly, be very accurate, but it's very different than the sort of robots in the home that you might, that we're starting to envision now. And there's been a big movement in the last, you know, 20 years now, uh, certainly the last 10 years, of trying to make cobots, robots that are more interactive, more uh, cuddly, I guess, uh, you know, more willing to, uh, to, to operate directly in the vicinity of humans and have that be okay. So that's Rod Brooks, who unfortunately the company isn't around anymore, but uh, you know, he started Rethink Robotics thinking about how do you make robots that are fundamentally safer to interact with and lower cost, and that could be like in, uh, in a bakery and, and, and not behind a fence. And maybe the dream is, uh, you know, we're all inspired by, by the movies, I think, but uh, I love Baymax, right? And, and uh, we've been working on projects that are inspired by, by Baymax and the like. Okay, so how do we get to more cuddly robots? I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll work through it. <clears throat> so, you know, here's some mug shots of some of the robots that you've seen probably in robotics papers these days and in uh, robotics labs these days. You can see a lot of them in the building if you, if you walk around. Um, so there's the UR series, with the Universal Robot Series. There's three, five, depending on the the number is the kilogram payload at the, at the end effector. Uh, that's the rethink, uh, there's, that's Baxter. There's a Sawyer robot is another one. You could recognize the KUKA. Canova Jacos are actually a great series of robots. They were originally designed to be on the end of a wheelchair. Uh, so unlike actually most of these, uh, one of the great things about Canova is it doesn't have a, a, massive, uh, a massive control box underneath that's hiding. It's actually a, a mobile robot arm. Uh, ABB, a maker of some of those en enormous strong robots, has gotten um, come towards the cobot with, with Yumi. Uh, Alberto's lab has a Yumi, at least one. Um, Frank Apanda is a new one that's uh, it's kind of a, the, the younger, lighter, uh, less expensive version of the KUKA. 
So there's a lot out there. Uh, and I would say it's, a, it's an extremely exciting time for the field in the sense that a lot of people are, are trying to innovate in cheaper hardware and low, you know, in uh, potentially, I mean, you could, I think it's easy to argue that the robots, most of the robots we have today were optimized for the factory workflow where they were high precision uh, you know, and, and high speed and that's probably not what we need in the home and you know, there's gonna be a new generation of robots coming into the home. So we're, we're seeing startups and the like build them, starting to build them aggressively now. Okay, the fundamental thing that's going on there, um, so, so I asked a question, so you know, why is it not torques coming in, but why is it positions coming in? Like what you have to know about, um, about what's underlying that, and that includes this KUKA robot, it includes almost everything, I, I think everything I put on that picture list, is that there are electric motors um, driving the robot, but they're, you know, in a, especially in an attempt to be a lightweight, you know, um, mobile robot, they try to pick small electric motors, right? And they make those small electric motors, which spin fast, but don't produce a lot of torque. They gear them up like crazy in order to produce meaningful, like human scale uh, forces and torques. Okay, so you can, it's not, um, it's not unusual to see gear ratios of great, ex in excess of 100, you know, 200 kind of gear ratios, okay? Um, and, you know, mathematically, that's just a, a scaling law. That's not, not a big deal. But in practice, it's a mess. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to remember to stay closer to the, you know, like you'll see me keep going like this and then remembering and then going like this. So um, let me just maybe point on here. Okay, so um, yeah, this is a, just, a, just a random picture of a planetary gearbox, okay? But, um, you know, Typically, in order to get big gear ratios, you need series upon series of gears that involve lots and lots of complex interactions, which include new sources of friction, backlash, be, you know, those gears bend under, under load. There, there's all kinds of messy stuff there. Okay, so um, we'll have you work out a little bit of, uh, in, a, in a problem set, there's, a, there's some nice details about it, but you know, this, there's a simple view of motors, which is that you know, current in is proportional to torque out. And that, I think that is a good model for, for motors, you know, with a couple extra details, um, <clears throat> until you put it into this gearbox. And then this, the current you've put into the gearbox is transmuted by some incredibly complicated uh, frictional and whatever, you know, backlash effects into something that is no longer simply proportional to, to current on the out output. So the conventional wisdom is that if you've got a gear ratio, let's say greater than 10 or something like this, then don't expect your current to be proportional to your torque on the output. Okay, so how do you get around that? Um, there's a few ways that, you know, this is what leads to position control as a defining um, concept. Okay, huge gear, uh, huge nonlinear transition. In fact, I've seen, I mean, you would expect, I, I, maybe some of you, when, you when, I, when I say something like that, you think, oh, we should learn that at a deeper level. And um, I think you should, probably. I, th I think people are, you know, every once in a while, you, see, you hear people saying, oh, I just, you know, I could totally model that in a, in a deep network. But it's, it's not easy. It's not, it's, you know, it's not just that there's like a complicated function. There's also hidden state. There's discrete state from these backlash, back and forth. You know, so every once in a while, people will say, oh, you know, I, I don't need a gearbox, you know, I've figured, I've solved the gearbox problem, and then you don't, you don't hear anymore, and then it's, you know, but one of these times someone's gonna say it and it's just gonna be solved and we're gonna be in a better place. Um, <clears throat> what people have done instead that has been very successful is um, you have to add sensors on the output of the transmission. <coughs> And the first bedrock sensor that we know how to add, we know how to work with, we, we can, you know, we can totally rely on is a position sensor. You know, you can, there's a handful of ways they come. 
potentiometers, encoders, optical encoders are not the most common, but not the only ones. Okay, but basically, you sense the thing you're spe you're specifically trying to con to control, and position sensors are easy, inexpensive to add. Okay, so, <clears throat> you know, why are we doing position control, you know, and why are we, we doing this feedback? I mean, it's, it, it's almost like the question of, you know, why are computers doing digital electronics instead of analog electronics? Like, there's just so much mess in the world there, and closing a tight feedback loop takes care of a lot of that mess. So what we do in the internal control laws they typically at the at the pulse width modulation, you know, right down at the electronics, the, the high the high power electronics going to the motor. Um, we're closing a tight feedback loop around that position sensor. Okay, so. Um, I mean, I think the, the details are, are can, can get subtle, but I think it's perfectly reasonable for our purposes to think of this as sending a motor command, which is coming right out of your power amplifier in some form, that is proportional to the error in position from a command in position. So, um, so how, what's the right way to think about a system like that? Well, if I have some joint with an actuator, let's say I'm just even trying to hold up a pendulum that's being pulled down by gravity, okay, and I'm trying to hold it at some um, desired, um, let's say I'm trying to hold it horizontal, but I'm, I'm measuring some angle, should probably be a negative angle in my notation. This term here is almost acting like a rotary spring that's pulling me back up towards that, that equilibrium, okay? As such, that term alone won't get me all the way to the equilibrium. It will, the spring will pull me to fight gravity, but at some point it'll actually come to equilibrium, balancing gravity with the spring force a little bit below, okay? This term adds some damping, so you get nice convergence instead of oscillation. This would be the simplest thing. And this last term, the integral gain, um, is what's watching that steady state error and slowly saying, okay, I gotta push a little bit more and push a little bit more in order to, to get the, the you know, to actually achieve my desired. So in position controlled robots, conce conceptually, um, I think of KP, KZ, and KI as being very big, okay? Like, the robot is really track, is capable of tracking desired trajectories with very high accuracy, very high precision, and it's very stiff. If you were to go up and bump into it while it's moving, it's gonna move you out of the way, roughly, okay? Um, which is, a, I think, an essential point. So, um, what would happen if I put in, if I put my hand in here, or if I put an obstacle in here that was impeding the robot's ability to get to the steady state, right? So, first of all, the, it's gonna 
if those gains are high, this is a really stiff spring, so I might already think against it. And then if I'm not careful, uh, I'm gonna just push harder and harder and harder until I, until I fault my motor, basically, and my, my robot will turn off, right? And maybe there's smoke, uh, which did happen one year in a live demo, but um, not this year. Uh, okay, so, um, so position control is a natural, super effective, um, effective approach for controlling robots accurately. But it does run into limitations when you're starting to work environments where you have unexpected contact. Okay, where you might bump into things, whether it's a human, whether it's some, some part of the environment that you didn't expect, some of these robots are just not well designed. Not, they're just not meant to be operated in a place where they could suddenly have you know, big unexpected contact. Okay, so we're gonna um, you know, think a little bit carefully about the alternatives and how those play out. I mean, this picture, I hope that, does that make sense? The, the basic picture, yeah? Um, you know, you could argue that it would do okay. Like it's really not that bad to just kind of push up against the obstacle, and it's, it got as close as it was as it could. You know, that was a reasonable accomplishing of its objective. If you have a multi-link arm, you know, and they're all all these joints are independently trying to achieve their objective, and they don't realize it's they're stuck. You know, things can get more com more ugly, more complicated, right? So. A lot of times these gains are set and the, the feedback law is set on each joint or each motor locally and they don't talk to each other. Um, there's a reason for that that you'll explore in your piece set. Okay. Um, but things, again, things can go wrong when you start having incidental contact. There's a different approach, which is actually um, was popularized in our mechanical engineering department. That's Harry Asada, some of you will know. That's Kamal Yusuf Dumi. I don't think he always is holding fish. Uh, I don't know, sorry, I picked a random picture. Um, <laughs> but they wrote, I mean, Kamal's thesis was actually about uh, these direct drive robots. And um, yeah, there's a beautiful book that got published out of that thesis work. Uh, and I, I'd actually recommend it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> it was ahead of its time. Uh, Back then, to make a direct drive robot, it meant enormous motors. Like, that, remember I said, you know, you've got these small motors and you gear them up. Okay, if you get, want to get rid of the gearbox, then you end up with an enormous armature on your electric motor. Okay, so it's just like big old motor, little arm, you know, like a T-Rex or something. Uh, um, you know, big old motor, little arm. And, uh, but it, when they did, when they put their motors in that regime, then they were able to get very low gear ratios and control torque directly. Okay, and that was, I think, um, you know, one of the first times we really got to see torque-controlled robots in action. Now our motor technology has gotten better. Our designs have have evolved. You can find torque direct drive or almost direct drive robots in much more reasonable form factors. Um, even if you, if anybody remembers the Barrett Wham robot, which was a cable-driven robot that was, you know, eight to one gear ratios because of very clever cabling. Um, and uh, you know it was a fairly lightweight robot that was that could uh, could move around, and you thought of that as having torque control. Um, Songbase Group actually has you know has done great work on, on torque, direct torque control in legged robots, especially. Okay, so there's an idea there, which is you just build your robots differently. In fact, um, some of the new uh, new robots I told you, I, oh, there's a new dis new breed of robots that are coming out. Uh, they are closer to direct drive, and they're using outrunner motors. Uh, you know, um, this great thing that happened when when uh, drones got popular, right? UAVs got popular. Everybody started making these outrunner motors, and in, in you know they optimized the design and reduced the cost. And those outrunner motors are pretty awesome for generating a lot of torque. That's what they just flip the armature out to the you know uh, it's just a slightly different design of a motor, but they're much higher torque, lower speed motors. And they are enabling the next, some of the next generation of low-cost robots. Okay, but um, the KUKA takes, achieves uh, some of this in a different way. Okay, so we talked about you know what you have a fundamental approach to this is to sort of add sensors to the output of the transmission. 
most people add position sensors, um, but you can also potentially add torque sensors. Okay, it's yeah. Could you just explain why torque seals are ideal to have torque controls? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I think the the danger here is that um, in order to get good tracking, then you end up having a high stiffness here, and I think for moving through position only commands, uh, it's, it's great. But when you enter situations where you have unexpected collisions and the like, it gets more dangerous. So I will continue to make that point in, when, I, when I finish with torque control, but I think it's gonna allow us to deal with more uncertainty in the environment. So can you so repeat that question? I can repeat that question. Um, Just the question. After the fact, yes, of yes. course. Uh, right, so uh, remind us why uh, the question was basically, can you remind me why torque control is a, is a desirable uh, thing to have? So um, this is a blowout of the mechanical design on the inside of every one of the joints on the KUKA, okay? Uh, it's incredibly um, nice design work. Uh, in particular, I, I mean, you can see there's a lot of details that go into these. There's big harmonic drive, so it is high, um, high gear ratio, okay? But they have a torque sensor embedded in the output shaft, okay? Now, torque sensors, depending on who you talk to, some people say torque sensors are like um, black magic. Or, you know, you have to, so, like some people get them to work really well, but they're really hard to get, uh, get to be very performant. You know, I've seen more and more people accomplish that, but I think uh, DLR was the name of the, the German space agency that did the initial design of these robots. I think they surprised people with how effective a torque sensing based on strain gauges and the like at the output shaft could be for a high gear rate ratio robot. So this was really an exceptional design that, that changed, I would say, our, our thinking about force control in, in practical robots. So <clears throat> torque, I say we have torque sensing on the output. That implies that we can do something like a low level feedback loop directly on torque instead of directly on position. But it also becomes essential in these sort of unexpected contact situations. So to, to answer the question in a different way is if you want to do things like this, you know, this is Sammy Haddadin. Oh, I hope my internet's good enough. Okay, yeah. Um, right, so this is Sammy when he was a, a student at, um, and he was working with the the German Space Agency, and he was making the point of these robots being um, you know, human-robot interaction. And when he talks about human-robot interaction, this is physical human-robot interaction. Uh, and there's a great series of videos that I think added to the um, impact of that work, if you will. Um, and, and you know, he's got him, if, if we let it go long enough, he'll, uh, he'll hit himself in the head and uh, there's even a series where the robot's got a sharp knife. Uh, <gasps> I wasn't gonna show that one, but, but the fact that they could be moving at high speeds with an inertial robot, detect the changes in torque, and stop quickly. I mean, that, you know, that's important too. Um, it's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Good, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I hope I land that. If, if I don't answer that in a second, so the question was, why is torque control safer in collisions? Right, and, and I, I, I think I will land that in a second. Um, okay, uh, just, just to say that there's, so adding torque sensors is not, uh, you know, position torque sensors in this is not the only approach that has been successful for making torque controlled robots. Atlas actually had torque control. We, we thought of it as having torque control in the legs and it was more position control in the arms. But Atlas, um, this is version one, the new one is much more, uh, it's a beautiful design. I mean, this was a beautiful design too, but it's you know, generation one of, of something even more incredible. Um, you know, this is a hydraulic robot, right? So it had a big pump in the middle of its chest and it was pumping hydraulic fluid and shunting it through these valves in order to control how much uh, force, how much work was being done at each, uh, at each joint. And the way that you would measure torque on this was it, it didn't have a transmission as per se, but it would have, um, we would measure the differential pressure across the valve. And that would be a surrogate for torque, but not a great one. We had to 
Um, we had to try to calibrate around it a lot, okay? But we thought of this as having torque control. And, and for walking robots, a lot of people um, believe that torque control is essential, again, for interacting with the, you know, if you don't know exactly where the ground is, then being able to be in a more torque control mode instead of a position control mode is, is excellent for a legged robot. I would say legged robots promoted torque control uh, early. In fact, I would say most legged robots try to act like they're in torque control when their leg is in contact with the ground and in position control when they're swinging and then torque control. So they do their best to emulate both. Okay, if you have torque control and you have an exceptionally good model of your robot, those two things go well together. So this is a par part of the answer to your question here. So um, our, our mathematical models of our robot at the level of torque in motion out, you know, given by Newton's equations, uh, if we can control torque, then we can do things like gravity compensation. So let me actually pause that and, and tell you what I'm saying. Let's talk robot equations, okay? So the dynamics of our robot, whether it's that robot or Atlas, uh, they, the physics of our robot are basically F equals MA, right? But we're gonna do better than that. So I say F equals MA is my starting point. The particular shape of the forces that we get from gravity and the way we think about, we can write out this term for robots that are in the canonical manipulator form. Uh, this set of equations will take on something that will be familiar to you by the end of the class. Um, a slightly more general, or I would say it's more specific actually, but it's a, a more tailored version of those equations, specifically for our robot case, for our rigid body systems, multi-body systems. This is MA, okay? And this is our forces. But let me break it down to be clear. So we think of this as the mass matrix or the inertial matrix. Positions, generalized positions. We'll just say positions for now. If you like Lagrangian mechanics, you know those as generalized positions. Um, Q dot is the velocity. Q does not. Like this, these are all joint positions, joint velocities, joint accelerations. Okay. Now, why do I say those terms together? I should, you know, this is a Coriolis matrix. Those terms go together to make up the mass times acceleration. It would take a longer time maybe to fully convince you of that, but but those two go together. Those are those are the uh, the, the inertial effects, okay? And um, <coughs> this is my forces due to gravity, my torques due to gravity. So if 
you were to take a free body diagram for the KUKA or for Atlas, and you were to turn the crank on an F equals MA, or your Lagrangian mechanics, you would get out something that you could write in this form. Now, what is gravity compensation? Okay, so gravity compensation is basically, I'm gonna choose u to be negative tau g. In the simplest form, it's just this. So that means you have a model of your robot. You know the lengths, the masses, the inertial, even potentially the friction. Sometimes the gravity cap also tries to cancel out the friction, okay? And your goal is to basically make your robot act as if it's in, you know, in free, in, on the ISS or something, okay? Like it's, ta it's taking gravity out of the picture. Yeah? So when you have those torque sensors, are they measuring you or are they measuring the entire right hand side? It's subtle. It's super subtle, right? So the question was, is when I have the torque sensors, are they measuring you or are they measuring the entire right side? We're gonna actually derive, when we get to the force control part, we're gonna see the stiffness controller um, because, yeah, it's way subtle. <laughs> uh, it's a mixture and for a good reason and uh, yeah, but that's a great question. Okay, so, um, so if I were to have uh, gravity compensation, and also I, I should really call it gravity and friction compensation, because you might also have additional forces here due to joint friction, okay, and you'd like to cancel those out too. I won't write them all on the board, okay. But these demos of gravity comp are kind of like how you strut your stuff. If you've got a force controller and you want to say, like, I've got a good model of my robot, I've got a good for force controller, then the demo you do to make people ooh and ah is you, you put it in gravity comp mode and you make it look like it's not there, right? That's success. And so, that, so that's what I was showing here. Ah, oh, come on. Sorry for those of you following along, just click again. So, you know, you're in space or something and someone just pushes you. The robot has a lot of friction in, in its joints. It's got a lot of inertia. You shouldn't be able to push it with its pinky. His pinky, right? This is, you know, you can even see him smiling. You know, this is, <laughs> this is how you show off when you've got really good <laughs> torque control, right? Okay, so yeah, again, that's, that's not just good torque control, that's also a good model of your robot because you need to know what torques to apply. All right, so now torque control plus good model is the longer answer to your question of how does that make me do better against contact, okay? basic idea enough to realize why we picked Iwa here. Um, <clears throat> so stiffness control is roughly, um, let's say gravity and friction compensation. The simplification bugs me a little bit, but, uh, but I think it's still the right way to talk about it here. So, um, so let's think about even in, in, in our simple example here, okay? So if I draw my pendulum again, I've got gravity flowing down on me, mass, okay? I'm trying to go to the horizontal. 
So um, remember I said that the PID control was error driven? Yeah. Ah, good. This is for um, PID position control. So when we talk about PID position control only, you know, trying to regulate this, we said it was an error-driven controller, the gains had to be high, and then I would have an integral term that took out the slot. Okay. Most of that was just trying to compensate for this gravity term that we didn't know about. If I add in an extra term that just removes the gravity portion, then what that effectively lets me do is turn the gain way down on my PID control. Okay, this is the longer answer to the question, right? Is that um, I can even I can even show it. So let's think about this as a um, as a, our equations of motion of our pendulum are super easy, especially if I think about it in steady state. At steady state, I must have a torque being applied here has to balance um, uh, MGL hosts beta in order for those to be in balance, right? If I say I'm going to apply that, I'm going to find that torque with just P, P control only for that, And in order for, to drive this to be a small error, I need to choose KP and KB to be large. Okay. If I instead choose for my controller, I have to be a little realistic. I don't know the mass exactly. I'm going to approximate it. Gravity, I can pretty much say I know exactly. I'll say that was not an approximation. I use a hat. expect to be happening. And then my KP and KB term. Now if M and L are spot on, then that's just going to cancel out this term. And the only work this has to do is if there's some unexpected disturbance in the world. Okay, but my mathematical model is those that those should do no work. Okay, that they can, I could set them to zero. So the only thing I have to respond to is not the friction in the joints, the gravity. I'm restricting, I'm targeting my feedback just to the, the unexpected things in the world. As a result, I can choose these gains to be much lower. And that matters in practice, right? So there's demos that we have done that I, I even showed you before that. You know, I always think of the, the dish, when we open the dish rack, or the dish uh, washer door, okay? Like, we don't know exactly where that door is. We kind of approximated it. We pulled it down. You know, if we, if we were just a little bit off, and we, you know, we pulled it down, it's got some constraint here, um, and then we even shoved the thing from the top, okay? If we didn't use a low stiffness control mode for that, we would have been highly dependent on the accuracy of, that, of all those transformations. If we weren't exactly dead on and we didn't carve out exactly the right curvature in our arm, then that, wouldn't, that demonstration wouldn't have worked, okay? The position-controlled robots have a much harder time dealing with any of the uncertainty or tolerances, okay, uh, in the, from the world. You know, this, we just make it kind of soft and squishy, and if it's, it, I would be surprised if we were very close to the desired trajectory. I would guess that the hand being in the, um, you know, in the slot there, as we execute that, I should try to make a plot. I, I would guess that we were pretty far off our originally intended tra trajectory because it was bending, letting itself bend to the will of the dishwasher door. Right. So for me, um, force control and having a good model can dramatically. Uh, change the way you interact with the environment. You can do, like, 
you can get incredible performance out of a position control loop and you can make a, torque, a great high bandwidth torque control loop like a position control loop. You know, uh, mathematically you can, you can do anything, sort of, you can make one look like the other. All of these details become in the quality of the signal of your, that you're measuring, the bandwidth of your controller, you know, it's all the details that make one of those better or worse than the other. Any questions on that? Oops. Okay, so um, let's think a little bit about how we actually um, model some of this stuff. So maybe I, I convinced you that there's at least a little bit more going on, the sort of gravity comp, there's a PID control maybe going on, okay? So when I go to give you an abstraction, which is this robot station, which has an EWA, it has a hand that we didn't mount in time, we didn't, or I didn't want it to break off in the elevator. Um, there's cameras around, we're giving you some abstraction, but the details under there are not just the physics of the arm, they're also the control cabinet and all the other stuff. Um, so we have concepts for all of these things in the system's um, way of thinking. Okay, so the that A part, the manipulator equation. Okay, we do think of that as a mathematical model that takes torques in and has position and velocities out. Okay, um, you know, in break it's called the multi-body plant. It's weird, you know, but um, we all know it and love it, okay? And this is because it's a many-body system, so we are leveraging all of the structure that you get from recursive equations of motion and the like. Okay? Um, <coughs> you can make multi-body plants of all of your robots very easily, right? The um, multi-body plants are such a common thing to simulate that there are description formats that you just basically find on the web a description format <laughs> for your favorite robot. This is the this is the one for the EWA. It's in uh, XML format. This is the SDF is one of the robot description files, and you just type in you know where are the what are the inertial properties, you know what are the meshes that that define it, you know what are the material properties of those meshes, the relative transforms between the different links. And there's just text files that were basically, in which you almost never have to author because you can just download. When you're building your own robot, you author the file, okay? Um, but for, for the robot itself, you tend to just find those, okay? The suppliers, the robot makers will supply those files, which is cool. Okay, and you can just parse that directly into the multi-body plan. Okay, and that, and we'll do that, you'll do that a little bit if you go through the chapter notes. Um, <clears throat> So that gives you this, you know, this first system. Now the multi-body plant can be used in many different possible ways. Um, the one we're talking about here is, is the um, actuation input port, which we're thinking of as tau, and we're getting um, continuous state out is q and q dot. Okay, but as you can see, you can get reaction forces out, you can get contact forces out, you can apply disturbance forces in. There's, it's, a, it's a general physics engine sitting inside there. Okay, but the way we, the first pass that we'll take, the simplest version of modeling the controller box is gonna happen in a few steps. So we're gonna have this inverse dynamics controller here, which is an, an approximation of that stiffness controller. So what does inverse dynamics do? So I already have the equation. We'll go through this in more detail. 
That acceleration. Yes? Uh, is there a difference in what is the difference between a closed mind uh, and a closed mind? That's like the second No, that's great. So um, we're going to do forward kinematics uh, and the like too. I think uh, in both cases, um, well, the, the, the notion of an inverse problem is like, is, um, is common in lots of different right, right, um, domains. So um, the only thing that's, I would say, different about the inverse kinematics in the sense is that um, I think of the forward kinematics as being very easy and the inverse kinematics as being hard, uh, potentially underspecified or whatever. In this case, somewhat oddly, the forward dynamics is actually a little bit harder. Well, it's, it's uh, in the simple case where you have enough actuators, one actuator for every joint, then actually the inverse dynamics is easier. I can just plug in my terms on this side, okay, and just get U out. The forward dynamics, ironically, I actually have, at least have to inverse, take an inverse of this matrix, which is um, you know, more expensive. This is the forward dynamics is what you need for marching a simulation forward. There are many reasons to think of it as like the core, the more essential dynamic quantity. And this is more of a control quantity. But that's, yeah, you're going to see those connections. Good question. And I don't know if I repeated the question, but it was, uh, the question was, are there similarities between forward and inverse dynamics? You can, you can yell at me immediately if you want. <laughs> I'm doing better. Um, OK. So um, the inverse dynamics controller takes in uh, an estimated state and a desired state. So it's actually going to requires that information to come in to know where the robot is actually in, you know, what state it's currently in in order to, um, to compute these quantities. You also pass in a Q uh, and Q dot desired. Okay. And then there's also a desired acceleration in there, an option, optional desired acceleration. If you read the fine print, this inverse dynamics controller is actually doing a little bit more than just computing the inverse dynamics. It's also got a uh, closing a PID loop on, on this. So it's doing something like our stiffness control inside it. So even inside here, if we were to take the, you know, open it up, we'd see a couple different la layers of complexity inside. Okay. <coughs> and then Still from here, I have to get all the way out, so all I actually send to my, my EWA is a desired position. Okay? So there's even another step here, which if I step out, I have to somehow model the way that this control box is taking a stream of position commands, differentiating it, inferring you know, from a stream of position commands a velo an intended velocity also, and it fits this um, you know, state interpolator discrete derivative. Okay, so I would say this is still a relatively coarse level of fidelity for getting super high quality simulation of that, of that robot. Okay, you can go in finer details, you can talk about exact control rates, you can talk about encoder counts, you can talk about, you know, quantize this and that. Um, this one has served well. At some point, you know, this is a good enough model of the robot that the, the stuff you're bumping into in the world is, dominates my, you know, lack of modeling of the encoder counts. Uh, but
but but I, I actually think you can do better uh, without much too, too much work. <clears throat> and I really mean it to be you know uh, another example of this idea of somehow that we're encapsulating this as this is just the physics part of the of the um, manipulation station diagram. So the cameras and other things are all mocked inside there with, with proper simulations. So what's this the two D outside and two D inside different uh, one is the design one is built? They're the same. Um, in fact, so this system uh, it actually just passes through the desired position, takes a derivative and turns it into a desired, you know, both position and uh, velocity. Which is our best guess at the first level of, of implementation that they, I mean, it's our simple model of what we think is happening inside. This would not be a great model of, um, of, of, of a stiff, this could, of, a, of a much stiffer position controlled robot. Right? This is something that is more unique, and in particular, I get to pick the gains to be much lower in these controllers uh, in order to, to model what, you know that robot complying to the dishwasher. I'd say the other reason we picked EWA is because it doesn't break. <laughs> and I, that really matters. Uh, like, it, like, it just really always works. We've blown a fuse or once or twice, you know, but you just go to the hardware store and get a new fuse, roughly, and uh, uh, it's inc it, it is a luxury to work on a robot. I, I worked on walking robots, often that I built myself, which always broke, and then I mean, Boston Robot Dynamics robots didn't break very much, but still, uh, to have this like almost never break is really pretty cool, uh, especially if uh, you're doing class projects on it. Mm -hmm. Quick question. Of course. So to find the gains for the controller in simulation, do you have to do a lot of experiments on the hardware to like ID those gains? So that's a great question, which I will repeat. Uh, uh, do you have to, how do you find the gains in simulation? Yeah. Um, the first point is actually because we don't model the extra details, the gains in simulation tend to be different than the gains in reality. So that is, you know, one of the places where I think sim to real is not happening. We have we carry two sets of gains, and yes, we tune them separately to get a. Um, you can do it through a full system identification. We tend to approximate it and get pretty close uh, with some you know, round numbers. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Any other questions on torque sensing and control or why we picked EWA? Okay. I also made the point that physics is, you know, a piece of simulation and we didn't even simulate cameras or anything yet or sensors, but simulation really is a lot bigger than just having a physics engine. Okay, let's talk about robot hands. I've got some Fun robot hands here, okay. Um, this is what I think of when I think of robot hands, right? I think of like the fully dexterous um, hand, you know. Uh, this is an Allegro, this is the shadow hand. They're always holding light bulbs or something fragile. Uh, you know, or an apple is a common, you know, a lot of, lot of glamour shots with robot hands holding apples for some reason. Um, <clears throat> okay, but you don't see as many robots using those hands as you'd like. I, Allegro is starting to, to get more popular, I would say. Um, but as beautiful as they are, they are, they are bigger than you might think, first of all. Uh, uh, this is, the shadow hand is actually pretty close to human form factor. The Allegro hand is bigger than a, than a human hand. Um, they're not as wonderfully dexterous as the human hand yet, right? And they break a lot. <laughs> Unlike this, uh, these things break a lot. I actually think uh, in the, um, you know, if you've seen this open AI finger gating example, if you talk to the people who did that, or I think even said it in the articles, but that's a shadow hand. Um, I think they spent, I mean, they banged on that hand. They were doing reinforcement learning, you know, hours and hours a day on that hand. Um, and I think a lot, there was a lot of work trying to make that hand more robust enough to survive the experiments, right? It, it was a major engineering effort to keep that hand going. 
And there's an argument that you don't need it. Okay, so uh, here, here's the argument, right? Um, I think you could go to the toy store and buy one of these things for you know one ninety nine uh, or whatever. And if I asked you to do like some really impressive thing in the home, like I don't know, fold my laundry or something like that, I bet you could do a pretty good job with those with those little grippers, right? So um, I think, of course, having a fully dexterous hand would be enabling. But if you've got a, you know good software up here. I think you can probably do pretty well uh, with a pretty simple hand. So that has taken sort of, a, there's a different camp, I would say, in the, uh, the robotics manipulation world, which does the sort of simple hand version of this. This is um, a famous video of the PR2 um, when it was just being born, um, and it's being teleopt in this video. So this is a long time ago now. Uh, but it was just like, okay, two finger gripper, this robot can do anything you want in the home, basically. This would be a totally useful robot in the home, despite having relatively simple kinematics and especially very simple hands. Right? They have, there's a whole series of these videos. They're like um, getting beer out of the fridge and do, you know, all the things that you want. Um, <laughs> so um, the Shunk WSG, which is what we picked here, it's right here. You can put whatever fingers you want on it. You'll see us using lots of different fingers and lots of different um, applications, but it's sort of the Iwa equivalent of the of the two finger grippers. Okay, so you can you can get two finger grippers at the toy store for a dollar or whatever. You can spend 15k on this, um, <laughs> and, and you get force control, uh, basically, wow. right? And an incredible amount of logic, which is hard to simulate, um, that will like um, squeeze until it thinks it shouldn't squeeze anymore, and not overheat, and and do a lot of clever things, which are sometimes, you know, you wish it would just do the linear equation, but um, it's, a, it's been a very good hand in terms of a high quality hand. It's, a, it's the luxury two finger gripper, I guess. Um, so, but I'd say, I'd say most of the story we took from the Iwa is also uh, sort of the same reason here. Maybe we needed a little less here. Like I, I don't know if we're getting as many benefits of force control when we squeeze our fingers together. Uh, I brought a few other hands, um, and Danny, who's uh, in the other side, has the Sandia hand. So we actually, um, we have a bunch of robot hands around the lab. Uh, many of them were on Atlas at one point. We were trying lots of different hands. Um, and we learned a lot about robustness of hands uh, by trying to have a 400 pound humanoid like pick up lumber and stuff like this and uh, occasionally fall down because your walking algorithm is still in development and uh, you know, you land on your hand and that's not uh, what they want you to do. It's like voids your warranty instantly. Um, <laughs> so you know, pretty much every cable on any one of these hands has been broken. Um, and despite having like this beautiful dexterous Sandia hand that actually has cameras in its palm and, and um, we ended up most, doing most of the competition with uh, this, this Robotique, the one in the bottom corner here, which is a Robotique three-finger gripper. In fact, the one, um, the one Danny has with her is uh, battle scars. You know, so it's like, it looks like it survived a, a nuclear uh, war because I think Atlas did fall on it uh, in the competition, unfortunately. Um, but there's a lot of great hands out there. This is a very clever one. It's, an, uh, you know, it's, it's underactuated in the sense that it's got clever four bar linkages. And when you just close the hand like this, whatever object it happens to be coming into contact with, it will close its hand around that object without knowing what the object is, just using the, the clever four bar linkage mechanics of the, of the hand, which is super, super good. Um, this is the iHi hand, for, which is a collaboration between iRobot and Harvard and Yale, it's got, um, it was similarly underactuated and cable driven and nice and light and good. Although we did get stuck carrying a two by four for a long time because we snapped the cable. Um, it was a really bad day. Um, there's also some things that don't look anything like a human hand. Okay, so um, this is one of the, one of my favorite extreme examples, which is one of the jamming grippers. Okay, so it's a bag of coffee beans, roughly. Okay, you put it on the end of a hand with some suction on one end, okay? And when there's no suction, no pressure, the coffee beans move around and it's just this flexible hand. Um, but then when you suck, you get a jamming uh, effect on the granular media. And basically it will retain its shape, even jam onto the objects. 
and this little jamming gripper can pick up pretty much anything. And they, they picked up all, I mean, really impressive you know, eggs. See, like, you know, if they eat, you can see apples and eggs. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> right? So I think there's something to be said that maybe we're overly fascinated with the human hand and we should just be willing to explore more. I mean, there's a lot of people now using suction in, uh, in applications, uh, which I think makes total sense for a lot of applications. Mm. Okay. There's also a, a, a variety of soft hands, which depending on which boutique lectures we end up with, um, uh, you know, we might talk about um, some, some soft hands and the like. Um, this is, um, you know, these are like gelatinous fingers, right? Um, that, that use uh, you know, changes in pressure to, to do roughly the open AI, I mean, this is obviously a play on the open AI demo, but with, you can see the, all skills are executed without any sensory feedback, right? So there's really an argument, oh, I didn't, I didn't know they actually directly head to head themselves with the open AI in the video, but um, there are some beautifully clever soft hands that can do a surprising number of dexterous things. Now, I, I think there's still a debate about how how far we're going to get with like those fully squishy soft hands. Like it might be hard to button my shirt or some you know dress shirt or something like this. I think there's probably things that it wouldn't be very good for yet, but probably the evolution of hands will be something like those kind of soft things and the fully dexterous things. Uh, we'll see. This is a, a soft two-finger gripper uh, that was uh, done at, at TRI. It's got um, big bubble sensors and the uh, big bubble grippers. So, but one of the great things about it is it's got cameras behind the gripper and, and, and these dot patterns. They, they used to be depth cameras. Now they're even just uh, RGB cameras. And, uh, and so you can see through the through the skin and basically get some tactile sensing back also. And that's an evolution of a lot of important ideas that I will, I will talk about, about for starting from gel site and gel slim and there's a lot of related work uh, that I'll tell you about. But, okay, wait a second. So I have to set this one up. Best robot video ever, maybe. Maybe, like, but certainly one of my, when I get asked, like, I, you know, you're at a robot conference and you have to like write your favorite robot on your name tag, right, to the <laughs> icebreaker. <laughs> I, I always say this robot, okay? <laughs> this is a normal robot hand where they basically took all the safeties off and overclocked the motors, like, just beyond reason. And they did the same thing with these gimbal-based cameras to track things, okay? And, uh, <laughs> and this is like, I, Probably the robot smokes if it's run for more than like a minute, but they do just incredible things with this robot. <laughs> okay, here we go. Dribbling, right? Look. Spinning. Pen spinning. Okay, here we go. <laughs> oh. It's also like giving us the finger at the same time. <laughs> I hope the best one's at the end of this video. Going's pretty good. Let me see if I can get ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, I'm gonna skip ahead to the my favorite. Let's throw a cell phone up and catch it just like that. Whoa! <laughs> that's like yeah, that's the best one. So I think, uh, you know, who knows if our hands are going to be like that in the future, but um, it's nice to dream. <laughs> cool. Um, that was what I wanted to discuss today. 
Any other questions or? What group is that? Uh, that's the uh, Ishikawa group. Uh, yeah, I can. I think I, I'm almost certainly referenced in the notes. I love that hand. I think I, so. I met some of the people that worked on it, and I don't think they caught the phone very often. You know, like that was a, <laughs> that was a pretty good shot, but uh, but the hardware is just awesome.